Great. Okay. All right. Well, it's 6.03, so why don't we get started? Uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, it is my name is Dr. Sean Rogers. I am uh, the co-founder of the Inova Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center um, with locations in Alexandria, Fairfax, Fair Oaks, Gainesville, and, and next summer should be in Loudoun. And I'm also the director of the Inova Memory Disorders Program. And tonight I'm gonna to be talking about Parkinson's related dementia, uh, diagnosis and treatment, a little bit comparing it to Lewy body dementia. But before I get started, a few things. So the, this is part of the PFNCA's Parkinson's Pointers Lecture. And it's a program based on only Maryland-based Parkinson's Foundation of the National Capital Area or PFNCA. PFNCA is an independent charitable organization and is not affiliated with any of the many national charities that focus on Parkinson's disease. Today's lecture is provided with support from Kensington Senior Living. We are grateful for their, for their efforts, so thank you very much. A few quick announcements. For those of you that are new to the PFNCA, the organization provides more than 30 wellness classes online each week using Zoom. These classes which focus on exercise and communication skills can be a great resource for you. You can learn more at www.pfnca.org. Each year, PFNCA's Medical Advisory Board which I'm happily a member, produced an educational conference known as the PFNCA Symposium. Planning is underway for this program that will take place online in the spring. You will be sent information when the agenda is finalized and registration opens. So for today, you're invited to send your questions through the question answer box. So try not to use the chat box. So we have one place to look. There's a question answer box. Put any questions in there and we'll go through all of those at the end after the lecture. Okay, so let's begin. Once I figure out my computer, there we go. Perfect. All right, so here we go. Okay, so again, I'm uh, Dr. Sean Rogers, member of the Inova Parkinson's Movement Disorder Center and Inova Memory Disorders Program. And tonight we're going to talk about Parkinson's dementia and related condition, diagnosis, and therapy. Okay. So first off, in case you've ever wondered, we always include a slide like this about disclosures. What is a disclosure? A disclosure is saying that I have nothing to disclose. I am not working necessarily for a company, a pharmaceutical company, or any of the companies for the drugs or products or anything I'm mentioning today. This is purely educational and I have nothing to disclose otherwise. Um, that's the, I guess, the legal portion of the extravaganza. So first off, uh, some important terminology. So a lot of times when you're either reading online or talking to your doctor, the term Lewy body comes up. And most of us think of it associated with Lewy body disease or Lewy body dementia. But an important thing to realize is what a Lewy body is, is it's a buildup of this protein in the brain called alpha-synuclein. So alpha-synuclein is present in any of these synuclein diseases, Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, or Lewy body disease, or multisystem atrophy. Really all it is, is this little picture over here to the right, is a picture of a cell under a microscope of a dopamine cell that has these proteins that build up. And essentially, because the protein builds up and it can't, we can't get rid of it in Parkinson's disease, the garbage disposal, if you will, gets overwhelmed and they build up and they cause cell damage and cell death. That is what causes the loss of cells in the brain in Parkinson's disease and the other conditions. So when we talk about a Lewy body, they're actually present in Parkinson's disease, the same as Lewy body disease. The biggest difference is First off, location, location, location. The old adage is true, even in Parkinson's disease, that where you have this alpha nuclei, alpha synuclein buildup and these Lewy bodies build up dictates what symptoms you will have. As I'm sure that many people on here know that not every person with Parkinson's has the same symptoms, the same progression. And that's even more different than someone with say multi-system atrophy or Lewy body disease. So what we understand through a lot of research is that Lewy bodies or alpha synuclein starts peripherally in the GI system in the skin, transported up to the brain through the vagus nerve. And then as it expands, so if you look at this little picture, it starts in that little red dot right there. 
And as it expands outward is when you get more symptoms. As it goes further out into the front part of the brain called the frontal lobe or the parietal lobe, or a part of the brain called the hippocampus that's very important for memory, as those Lewy bodies or alpha synuclein proteins build up and spread outwards, that is when people can start having memory problems. This part of the brain is actually very tightly packed. There's lots of different cells and connections. And as a result, it doesn't take too much for the expansion outward that can affect anything from sleep or mood or in this case, memory. Now, the second biggest difference between Parkinson's disease and some of the other diseases that also have Lewy bodies is timing. How quickly do we see a spread? So as I mentioned before, Lewy body disease is also called diffuse Lewy body disease. These Lewy bodies spread throughout the brain at a much quicker rate. So timing and the nature of the symptoms often can dictate not only the exact diagnosis, but also the type of symptoms that, that the person can have. So diving right in now, dementia and Parkinson's disease. So what I like to tell my patients is memory loss and Parkinson's disease kind of comes in you know, four tiers. That right off the bat, as we get older, our memory can get a little bit worse. But even beyond that, about 60 to 70% of, of Parkinson's patients can start to have even mild memory changes. That's this list down here on the bottom right. Those are actually just mild cognitive changes, not even considered dementia and Parkinson's disease. It takes a little longer to perhaps do some mental processing, a little longer with math, a little longer with word finding, maybe a little trouble with attention, but not to the degree of a dementia or even a true mild cognitive impairment. It's really just when those alpha nuclein proteins starts to interfere with the, the circuit. We know that dopamine cells in the substantia nigra are the main part of the brain affected in Parkinson's. And by the time most patients have even a physical manifestation of Parkinson's disease, they've already lost about 70%. But as we spread out, we restart getting the pathway for acetylcholine. And that's when you start having some of these mild memory changes. So step one, you can have the changes with age. Step two, you have some of these mild changes with Parkinson's disease. Then you could actually go on to have a mild cognitive impairment, which is essentially a, a diagnosis for worse than even changes with age, not quite dementia. And then in some cases, yes, it can go on to have a full dementia. In more advanced Parkinson's-related dementia, it can in some ways be very similar to Alzheimer's disease. And even some of the changes that are seen in Alzheimer's disease can occur in the more advanced Parkinson's dementia. Now, for the sake of comparison, somebody with Lewy body dementia or diffuse Lewy body disease or dementia with Lewy bodies, it happens in a little different time frame and can affect people a little bit differently, especially early on. Uh, Lewy body dementia is actually probably second to Alzheimer's disease in terms of causes of dementia. Um, it's about 30% of all dementias affects roughly 1.4 million people in the in uh, the United States. Um, but the difference with Lewy body dementia compared to Parkinson's disease is that things that tend to come on much earlier. So someone with Lewy body disease would have the part of the brain that affects thinking and memory um, affected much earlier on by the Lewy bodies and alpha synuclein. So typically someone with Lewy body disease will have earlier cognitive problems, usually within one year of Parkinson's symptoms. So if someone starts to have tremor, rigidity, all the things we associate with Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, it can take years, sometimes decades, to start having memory problems, if at all. Whereas with Lewy body disease, there is always some degree of cognitive changes. Um, and it tends to be within one year of the onset of physical manifestations. So therefore, a relatively rapid onset usually we associate it with rapid cognitive uh, fluctuations. So sometimes you can have good days and bad days. It's true of all of this, but it's really prominent in Lewy body. Uh, obviously visual hallucinations are often associated with Lewy body dementia, certainly Parkinsonism, but may not respond as well to the Parkinson's medications. Um, and then last but not least, um, they can have REM behavior disorder. Now I won't go too much into that, but that's uh, for anyone that's ever seen it, um, it is when someone with Parkinson's or Lewy body can actually act out their dreams as common in all the Parkinsonian syndromes. 
but you can actually see that overlap between Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. Um, both Parkinson's and Lewy body, as it advances, you can actually see a buildup of some of the changes even seen in Alzheimer's. Now, again, that's a bit much more advanced. In Alzheimer's, it happens much early. But as you start to have a loss of these cholinergic cells, you can see changes similar to Alzheimer's. And eventually, Parkinson's disease dementia and Lewy body dementia are indistinguishable. A lot of times people will use those terms interchangeably, like someone will have Parkinson's disease and then you know, 15 years down the road, they'll start to have signs of dementia and someone might say, oh, now you have Lewy body dementia. So for what it's worth, technically separate. Um, so generally speaking, Lewy body is much earlier, but the important part, and what I try to stress to my patients is that whether it's Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's disease, when it gets to that point, how we treat it and how we approach it can be very similar because at that point, they can be very similar in terms of how they affect patients. But really kind of coming back to the ultimate difference, it's really location and timing of how the brain is affected. I included this simply not to go through the nuts and bolts of different chemicals, but just to show you how similar they can be you can have you know, reduction in the dopamine levels similar in Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, dementia, and Lewy body dementia, reduction in acetylcholine, which is the main chemical we use to think and for memory, very similar in Parkinson's Lewy body and Parkinson's disease, dementia um, as they advance. And certainly the activity in the brain as someone gets to the point of Parkinson's disease related dementia and Lewy body disease are as they get further along, again, very similar. So, you know, A, we all like pretty pictures and presentations to make it more interesting, but B, to kind of understand how much Parkinson's and Lewy body can overlap. And so when we're going forward in this talk, I included this because a lot of the treatments we're about to discuss can actually be used for either Parkinson's or Lewy body because of how much they can be similar as they advance. Now, one important point is that there's a thought in the world, even in medicine, that the medicines we have from memory don't help that much. And in some cases, they don't help as much as we'd like. But there's one important difference between Alzheimer's disease and either Lewy body disease or Parkinson's disease. Generally speaking, the medicines we have for memory and that we're gonna go through tonight tend to help in either Parkinson's disease and Lewy body disease more than they do in Alzheimer's disease. And that's why I included this slide. The reason I included this slide is that in Parkinson's disease, much like with dopamine, we lose the chemical, but we don't lose the path to where it's going. So if you replace dopamine, a Parkinson's patient can move better. The mechanism is there. We just need to replace the signal. The same thing's true in memory. In Alzheimer's disease, the point of this slide is on the right, all this red shows areas of the brain that are frankly damaged, that you can actually see down the road on an MRI and Alzheimer's disease, that these areas in Alzheimer's are actually damaged. And if there's damage, there's nowhere for the medicine to go. It at best tries to help a little bit with the remaining cells. But even in Lewy body, this picture on the, on the left, they don't actually lose as many cells. So if we can improve the chemical, improve the messenger, you can actually see improvement in some aspects of thinking, cognition, even hallucinations, and that's again where we focus our medications. And with that, treatment. So cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease dementia and Lewy body dementia comes from two main issues. One, an initial reduction in that chemical acetylcholine, which is the main transmitter for memory. And then later, as it gets more advanced, you actually have overexpression of a chemical called glutamate. Now glutamate is actually a normal excitatory stimulating chemical in the brain. But later on down the road, as it advances, that chemical is released too much and can actually do damage and cause more confusion in the brain. So our goal early on increase acetylcholine, since we have that structure there to improve that signal, and later decrease glutamate, to hopefully have enhanced cognition and reduction in hallucinations. So the first medicine that if you know anyone that's ever had any form of memory problem, it's going to be one of these medicines. The most common, uh, whether it's for Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, dementia, or Lewy body is the one in the bottom right, Aricept, also called, called denepazil. It, it is a chemical that blocks acetylcholinesterase. 
which again, we don't have to go too much into our fun little picture, but acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So by blocking this chemical or chemicals like it, you can keep acetylcholine around longer to hopefully allow the memory function in the brain to work better, enhance that memory. The second most common medicine is called rivastigmine, also called Exelon. It inhibits two different chemicals that break down acetylcholine. In the what it's worth, doctors will prescribe whichever one works best for you. And sometimes we have different ones, but technically the one that is specifically FDA approved for Parkinson's disease related dementia is Exelon. One of the nice advantages of Exelon is it does come in a patch form. Because as we know, in some cases, swallowing can be difficult. And in some cases, as someone advances and starts to have more difficult dementia, it can be a little tricky to get them to take their medicine. And so the nice thing about the patch form is a loved one can put on the batch, the back and leave it for 24 hours. And again, because it's a nucleus problem and not a receptor problem, meaning that we have a loss of the transmission, but the receiver is there, patients do tend to respond better to this than those with Alzheimer's disease. The second tier of medicine I mentioned is dealing with a chemical called glutamate. Again, with both Parkinson's disease and Lewy body disease, as that chemical acetylcholine is reduced, as the brain is struggling a bit more, the brain starts trying a bit harder and it overproduces glutamate to compensate for the loss of function. But too much glutamate is actually bad. It's like anything. Too much of this chemical just floating around the brain actually does harm to the brain and causes it harder for the cells to communicate and actually eventually then causes cells to die quicker. So the second medicine we can often add is called memantine. The name brand is Namenda because it blocks some of that glutamate receptor, specifically what's called NMDA receptors. And by doing so, it corrects this overexpression of glutamate. And we can again see hopefully an improvement in thinking, hallucinations. And in some cases, it can actually settle down a little bit of agitation because again, some of that agitation can come from an excess glutamate. Now, in most studies, it has not been shown to have a benefit in early dementia. Sometimes we try it and it can help some, but generally it's more indicated in more moderate disease. And all of the studies of Namenda included it as an adjunctive medicine to work with either denepazil or rebastigmine or galantamine, which is the third one. And those together is how we get the best benefit. Now it can provide some benefit by itself. And many times we try to, especially if the patient doesn't do well with denepazil or rivastigmine, but generally speaking, we, we include them together. Now, a fun little side notion, it is structurally similar to amantadine. So if you, any of you know, sometimes we can give amantadine to actually help with dyskinesias, but as this little picture on the right shows, they're very structurally similar. So amantadine can actually bring down dyskinesia a little bit. We wouldn't give it for that person, for to the person for that reason, but sometimes we can actually see that benefit when we add this. I include this one in case you didn't know, there is a combination pill. As I mentioned, they're most usually given together, so much so that Namzeric was created so that you could have a combination pill. Again, if someone's not the best about taking medicines or it's a little tricky to get them to take pills, this is much easier because as you see here, you can have one pill of Namzeric instead of two to three pills, depending on which formulation. This is also because it's a capsule, you can crack it open and sprinkle it. So again, if it's hard to take pills or there's swallowing difficulty, it can be sprink sprinkled on your favorite yogurt, pudding, et cetera. Um, and again, by combining it, it makes it a little bit easier, but the effect is the same. So it's still the same dose of Dinepazil and Mamantine, same medicine, just in a combination pill. Now, if you've watched virtually any television in the last, I don't know, three years, you may have seen a commercial for this product. Um, the most difficult thing about treating hallucinations in Parkinson's disease is that in many cases, it comes as the brain starts to get more sensitive to dopamine. So even someone that's been on carbidopa lava dopa for 15 years, once they start having hallucinations, in some cases, especially at higher doses, dopamine can exacerbate. And previously, up until about four or five years ago, before Neuplasm was invented, the only medicines that we could give to help someone with 
Parkinson's disease, dementia, and what's called Parkinson's disease psychosis, meaning having hallucinations or delusions, the only medicines we had available to us were medicines that were in a category called antipsychotics. Those antipsychotics all worked by blocking dopamine. And back then, even five years ago, the conversation would be, well, we can try to reduce the dopamine a little bit. That doesn't help. We may have to give a medicine that blocks dopamine to settle down the hallucinations. And that is why Nuplazid was invented. Nuplazid was invented because it's the first antipsychotic medication specifically designed for hallucinations, delusions, agitation in Parkinson's disease, dementia, and Lewy body dementia because it affects serotonin. It won't affect dopamine at all. So we don't have to have that trade-off. So you can see an improvement in hallucinations and delusions with no change in Parkinson's motor symptoms or what we call the Parkinson's disease rating scale. Now, one important note, I include this graph to the right because it takes a little while to kick in. So if you look at the little two graphs, the top line is placebo, meaning it kind of measures how much they're having in terms of their hallucinations. So when they first started for the first two weeks, there's really not a difference between the sugar pill. But at about the three week mark and definitely right about the four week mark is when it'll really make a difference. So in some cases, if we're starting to see hallucinations, we wanna get it started with the understanding it could take a good solid four weeks to take full effect. And when it does, if it, you know, it doesn't, obviously not every medicine helps everyone equally, but when it does help, it can really be like a light switch at that four week mark going forward in terms of like level of hallucinations or delusions. So it can be a very helpful medication. Now, this is always a question I get um, for any type of memory problems, not just with Parkinson's disease related dementia or Lewy body disease, but for anyone, what do we need to avoid to hopefully keep our memory from getting worse or to keep from exacerbating the memory problems in Parkinson's disease? So first, neuroleptic. Neuroleptics means any strong psychiatric medication, um, not necessarily your average antidepressant medicine, but, but strong, strong um, medications for psychosis like Haldol. Haldol theoretically can help psychosis, but because it's so strong, it can actually make people more confused. So we want to stay away from Haldol. Remember that. Otherwise, sometimes benzodiazepine. Um, sometimes we, we give our you know, we have to give patients medicines for anxiety, and we'll talk a little more about that. But sometimes if they're taking medicines that make them too tired, it can actually make it harder to focus and can actually make them more confused. We have to be a little careful with anything sedating. Uh, also, and this, one, this one we don't think about as much, but what's called anticholinergic. So I just explained to you how important acetylcholine is for the brain. But what we don't realize is some even over-the-counter medicines can have a negative impact on acetylcholine. The most common are... Uh, cold medications, NyQuil, over-the-counter sleep medicine. So Benadryl. Benadryl is diphenhydramine. Diphenhydramine makes you tired because it blocks histamine. It's an antihistamine. That's how it helps with sinus congestion, allergies, et cetera. But Benadryl or diphenhydramine also blocks acetylcholine. So generally speaking, it you know a little bit probably wouldn't do it, but if you're taking Benadryl or a nighttime sleep medicine that has you know Tylenol PM that has diphenhydramine in it, it can sometimes, over time, especially worsen memory. Some anti-emetics or anti-nausea medicine um, and some medicines for overactive bladder. And again, it's not all of them. And I, so I won't necessarily go through the list, but the key is, is it's important to make sure, I guess the take home from this is that for any prescription or over-the-counter medicines you're taking, make sure your doctor has that list. Even if you think, oh, I'm just taking Tylenol PM when I can't sleep, that's important to know because if someone's, taking two tabs of Tylenol PM every night to sleep and they're getting more confused overnight, that may be a very quick and important change to make. Some of the older Parkinson's medications, such as Artane or Cogentin, are very strong anticholinergics and can actually cause memory problems that look like um, Parkinson-related dementia, but then you just get rid of those and all of a sudden the acetylcholine comes back and people can think more clearly. I include alcohol, not that you have to entirely avoid it, you want to be cautious with it. We often, you know, think of the commercials once upon a time saying that, you know, a little bit of red wine is, is good for the heart, probably true, but a little too much alcohol in any form can actually exacerbate cognition. The parts of the brain that are most directly affected by alcohol are the parts of the brain called the mammillary bodies, which is for memory, the part of the brain for balance and tremors called the cerebellum. 
So generally speaking, a little alcohol is okay, uh, too much alcohol. And exactly what that threshold is, is hard to say. You know, one glass of wine every so often, probably fine. One to two glasses of wine every night can actually over time cause some memory problems. So, you know, when we start seeing some memory problems, we want to start weaning back even alcohol a little bit. Now, I include this one here, again, because we all love colorful slides, just to kind of remind you what I said in the beginning, that the area affected early on in Parkinson's, right down in here, is very tightly packed with chemicals for acetylcholine, the red lines, uh, the blue lines are what's called noradrenergic neurons that affects things like blood pressure regulation. So I'm sure some of you either have or know someone that has trouble with blood pressure getting busy when they stand up. And then there are even some green lines, which are serotonin, which is very important for mood. And I include that because a lot of times, even we as physicians miss the importance of depression and anxiety in a conversation, not just about Parkinson's, but especially about memory. So we know that serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine are all significantly reducing Parkinson's. So not just from a movement standpoint, but sleep, focus, mood, attention are all impacted by these chemicals. Um, there's actually been fairly extensive studies that have shown depression and anxiety and fatigue and apathy even are missed by neurologists 50% of the time because we don't necessarily talk about it. Uh, you know, we try to, but that's something that can be missed. So we want to make sure that we're thinking in those terms. And sometimes treatment separate from Parkinson's, separate from medicines for cognition, treatment with what's called an SNRI, SSRI, or simply medicines for depression can actually improve thinking, memory, and even hallucinations because depression can sometimes masquerade as dementia. There's actually a separate term called pseudo-dementia where if you have depression or anxiety, it can actually look like full-blown dementia simply because the brain can't focus when dealing with depression and anxiety as well as it should be able to. But in that case, if you give someone just medicines for memory, they may not see that improvement. But if there's this underlying depression or anxiety, if you can improve that either through medications or through therapy, you can actually see an improvement in thinking. Now, important to know, it's actually incredibly common in Parkinson's disease. Again, that area of the brain is very tightly packed. When you don't have dopamine, when you don't have enough serotonin or, or noradrenaline, um, you can feel very tired, you can feel very worn down, and yes, depression, anxiety, or apathy are very common. So I've seen numbers in different studies ranging from 40 to 60% of Parkinson's patients can have depression, similar numbers, 40% to 50% and then have anxiety apathy or that feeling like, eh, I just don't want to do anything. If you've worked with just about any doctor for anything, frankly, they're going to tell you how important exercise is, but especially for Parkinson's disease. And that's when apathy can really start to be tricky is even though you know you need to do it, but you're kind of, eh, I don't feel like it. That's kind of what we categorize as apathy. And that can have a big impact both on your overall Parkinson's symptoms, but especially in cognition. So I include a little bit about depression, anxiety, and apathy, not that we're going to go through in detail the diagnostic criteria. We're not going to have anyone self-diagnose themselves tonight. But the reason I include this is sometimes you'll notice that some of these symptoms look an awful lot like the symptoms one can get from Parkinson's disease itself. Sometimes they can look like side effects to medications. And sometimes it becomes a really tricky conversation when we're like, well, losing weight or gaining weight, not sleeping well, sleeping too much, not sleeping at night, slowing down of thought or movement, low energy. Those are the ones that can be signs of depression, but can also be from Parkinson's. So sometimes it's hard to tell. And so the way I like to phrase it to my patients is not de depression and Parkinson's doesn't necessarily mean that you want to go cry or sit alone in the corner. It certainly doesn't mean that you want to hurt yourself. Obviously, if those are there, please talk to your doctor immediately. But sometimes it's more subtle than that. It's simply this one, not having interest or pleasure in, in activities, that you just don't want to do the things that maybe you once did, or not wanting to do the things that you used to enjoy or that you know are, are helpful for you. And then this big one down here, diminished ability to think and concentrate. That really is how it applies here. And treating depression can make a huge difference. Very similarly, anxiety feeling restless or energetic, having trouble sleeping. But we forget that even anxiety can make you feel more tired throughout the day because it, your brain is kind of running it on a thousand miles an hour. 
difficulty concentrating, muscle tension, which can sometimes be confused with fluctuations or wearing off in Parkinson's. And last, but certainly not least, apathy, feeling like you don't necessarily want to do the things you used to do. I include these again because if you feel any of these things, fatigue, low energy, you know, we will talk about your motor symptoms. We'll certainly talk as much as we can about hallucinations, delusions, but sometimes before it gets there, if, if you're feeling tired or worn down, it could absolutely be your Parkinson's. It certainly could be um, life as, as it's been for the last two years when it's harder for us to get out and do the things we enjoy. But sometimes if we understand that depression can sometimes sneak in in Parkinson's when we don't realize it. Same thing with anxiety, same things with apathy. If we focus on those, try to treat those, try to make sure you know, that's why I included on the right here, some little tricks to, to try to get out and do things, make a schedule. Um, one of the reasons I recommend, if possible, getting out for physical therapy or getting out for just some scheduled activity, even just going for a drive, it kind of breaks you out of that rut. Focus on small goals. I like to tell patients if they're trying to build up their strength in their walking, don't plan on running a 5K next week, start doing a little bit more every day. So it's manageable and it doesn't seem so overwhelming. And again, medications for depression or anxiety can really help both from an overall Parkinson's standpoint, but especially from a memory standpoint. So again, we are not going to go through all these medicines. It's just to let you know there are lots of medication options. Not every medicine works for every person. As a neurologist, I will certainly in many cases recommend one. But in some cases, if it really seems like depression or anxiety is an underlying factor, again, not the cause of memory loss, but absolutely can exacerbate it. Sometimes as part of your treatment team, it's good to have a psychiatrist because then if say citalopram isn't working, they can help us to guide you through maybe other medicines that could while your neurologist is working with your Parkinson's medicines or your memory medicine. Now I wanted to include this one because it's a little bit different. So if you've ever heard of pseudobulbar affect, it can often be missed because people will mistake it for depression. So what pseudomobile affect is, it's an inability to regulate emotions. And it can be seen in anything that affects the brain, Parkinson's disease, Lewy body disease, strokes, Alzheimer's disease, even concussion. And what it is, is it's when someone can't regulate their emotions. Now, an extreme form, or the one that's kind of the textbook version, is when someone will just start laughing for no reason. Even if they're not happy, they might start crying for no reason, even if they're sad. The one example I can think of is that a very nice gentleman um, who, when I first, when he first told me about this, his daughter told me that when his friends would come over, he'd be so happy, but he would start just crying so much. And not like a happy cry, but like just really crying. And eventually when his friends left, his daughter asked him why he was sad. He said, he's not, he was just so happy, but the body couldn't regulate it. And I include this one because most people don't know there's a treatment specifically for that. And in some cases it can be angry outbursts too. So sometimes pseudomobile affect can be treated and it can take care of some of these extreme emotional roller coaster, if you will, whereas other medications don't. So that's why I want you to know there is a treatment for it. And if you've seen anything like that, talk to your doctor. Now, non-medication treatment, obviously counseling, having someone to talk to, Exercise, and again, if, like I said, for me or just about any doctor out there, we will always talk about how important exercise is physically, mentally, you name it, for Parkinson's disease. It's the one thing we know that's been shown to actually slow the progression of Parkinson's disease, so you, you should be trying to exercise as much as you can, but it actually makes a really big difference from a mood standpoint, and therefore can actually make a big difference from a memory standpoint. Um, mindfulness meditation, you can Google that online going to wellness classes, there's, there's a plug for the PFNCA. Um, anything to kind of try to keep your body and your brain active can actually help both from a physical and mental and memory standpoint, but it also happen from a mood standpoint. The thing to remember is when it comes to treatment, it shouldn't be, I'm gonna try a medicine or maybe I'll try to see you know, a counselor, I'll go to an exercise class. It should be anything and everything you can do to try to make it better because it can make a huge difference both in your mood, but also in terms of the manifestation of physical symptoms. Tremor, rigidity tend to be worse if mood is worse, and absolutely memory can be. Now, 
with that as our transition, what else can I do? Activity is the most important thing when we talk about both mood, but also physically for Parkinson's disease. And absolutely, when we start having a conversation about cognitive decline, the most important thing is being mentally and physically active. Exercise can slow progression, both physically for Parkinson's disease, but even mentally. And there's even a thing called cognitive therapy. It's done through speech therapists where they can actually start working on you if you start to feel like you're having some difficulty cognitively. Healthy diet and lifestyle, heart health, all the things we know from all the PSAs is similar to brain health. Watch your cholesterol, watch your blood pressure, get exercise, eat healthy, cut back or stop alcohol and definitely stop smoking. Um, I get asked a lot and I haven't even looked at the question and answer section, but there will probably be at least one question about supplements. The truth of supplements is there's not strong evidence that any particular diet or supplements make a huge difference. Now, I always couch that as there's, there's some limitations to the research that whenever a new medicine comes out for anything, um, pharmaceutical companies spend millions of dollars on research. And so we have pretty good data to know where it helps, how it helps, what are the side effects. Most supplements do small studies because that's all they have money for, simply put. And therefore, they, we might have small data that suggests it helps a little, but then there's sometimes other studies that doesn't help as much. If I had to pick, I would say vitamin E is, is good from an antioxidant standpoint that can help kind of slow some of the changes from memory. Omega-3 or fish oil has been shown to be complex. Ginkgo below, but maybe a little bit less. Um, if I had to pick a diet, the Mediterranean diet, because again, it's very good in terms of low fats, but good and high uh, levels of healthy cholesterol. Um, people always ask me about Prevagen. It's a tricky one. Um, if you listen to the commercial for Prevagen, they say that a subset of patients improved compared to placebo in, the, in patients with either normal mental function or mild changes. That's kind of what's said very quickly at the end of the commercial. And essentially what that means is in the study, the overall study for Prevagen didn't show necessarily that much benefit, but a few subsets, a few tests, and some patients with those tests did have an improvement. But again, supplements aren't regulated, so as long as they don't make outlandish statements, it's fine. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't work at all. And that's important for any supplement. There's nothing in that saying it absolutely doesn't work because there just simply hasn't been enough research. So usually my rule of thumb is if it can help maybe a little bit, great, as long as there's no harm. Most supplement, unless you have a random allergic reaction, shouldn't cause any harm. Prevagen is a little pricey for over-the-counter medicine. So some people might find that a harm that if it's not helping too much, it can be a little pricey to keep buying it. But I've had some patients that love it. I've had other patients that tried it for three months and didn't think it did a thing. So let's say at best case, jury's still out. Um, already talked about most of this, exercise, improves fatigue, energy, mood. Uh, there was a recent study that showed um, a 10 to 20 year reduction in cognitive age with regular exercise. And there's definitely been studies in all of the different diseases, Parkinson's, even Alzheimer's disease that consistent exercise actually slows the progression of both Parkinson's and in fact, Alzheimer's disease. Control your risk factors, don't smoke. Uh, diet, generally speaking, higher energy things like fat and calories are at increased risk of more vascular disease in the brain and that directly impacts Parkinson's disease and dementia. Um, poorly controlled blood sugars, for those of uh, our patients that have diabetes, that can make a difference. Um, efficiency food consumption has been shown to reduce stroke risk, vascular risk factors, and potentially some of the cognitive changes. Uh, lower alcohol intake improves uh, better hippocampal, that memory part of the brain activity. Um, moderate heavy drinkers were definitely more likely to have memory problems less and more, I included here, the white matter lesions or, or vascular disease in the brain. And we like to include this, the good old, just listen to your mother diet choices. All the things your mother told you um, about having a healthy diet, exercise is true, do them. Now, to be fair, I am from Georgia, so we had a lot of fried food. Um, so maybe I'll have to talk to my mom about that. But, you know, generally speaking, healthy, healthy, listen to your mother diet choices. So in conclusion, Memory, cognitive function, mood are all directly related to these chemicals in the brain, acetylcholine, serotonin, and dopamine. By evaluating each patient individually for the symptoms they're having and trying to find the right 
treatment plan, both medicine and non-medicine, that can improve can really improve their symptoms and really make a big difference from a cognitive standpoint. Um, proper diagnosis is key because it can make a big difference in terms of our, our what medicines work, what medicines don't work as well, when we need to add medicines. So generally speaking, it does not have to necessarily be me or my team, but consider seeing if you're not a movement disorder specialist, someone that can help you put all this together because it's complicated. It's hard to balance mood with memory with your Parkinson's symptoms, especially as we get into Parkinson's related dementia, because then we start to see medicines that overlap and start to contradict each other. And that's when things get a little bit tricky. So what does this mean? First off, just because you're seeing some cognitive change doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have dementia. That's super important to highlight, that worrying about it doesn't make it better. In fact, if you worry too much about it, as we said a few slides back, you can sometimes make it worse. So a little bit of a cognitive change is a normal part of aging. But if you're worried about it, talk to your doctor about memory changes, confusion, certainly about hallucinations and delusions, because there's testing that can be done to help us determine exactly where you're at on the spectrum. There's medications, obviously, that can help. Depression and anxiety happen. We as a country as a world need to stop treating depression and anxiety with such a stigma and recognize that it's a big part of life, certainly a big part of aging, and absolutely a big part of Parkinson's disease, and we need to understand it and treat it. And if that's the case, you know, we should consider a psychiatrist as part of the team. You know, you have your primary care doctor, if you have a heart problem, you have your cardiologist, if you have a kidney problem, you have a nephrologist, certainly you need to see a neurologist, hopefully a movement disorder specialist for your Parkinson's. But if mood is a factor that's not being well controlled, having a psychiatrist as part of your team can make a huge difference. And last but not least, stay physically and mentally active, eat healthy, and live your life to the best of your ability, especially in the middle of our ongoing global pandemic. And thank you very much. This is our team um, as it stands now, Dr. Walters, Sonia Gao, Dr. Falconer, Dr. Shanai, Dr. Whitney, and myself. As you can see, I am. Um, the one that has to put stuff on the high shelves. Everyone else is about the same way. All right, now we're gonna dive right into some questions. So thank you all very much. Okay, so um, again, any questions? I'll try to get through as many as I can. I think I did pretty well, 645, so we should have plenty of time for questions. So I'm gonna go through this. So first, um, from Brooke Ballinger, does Parkinsonism induced dementia different from other dementia? So first and foremost, an important terminology. So dementia simply means a gradual decline in thinking or memory. It can be any aspect. It could be language. It could be short-term memory. It could be long-term memory. Anything that, um, the, that causes a decline in cognition is a form of dementia. So Parkinsonian dementias are different because they tend to have physical manifestations as well. So someone with Alzheimer's disease may, for the entirety of their disease, may never have tremors or balance problems, et cetera, or stiffness of muscles. Whereas typically if it's Parkinsonian dementias, you will see some aspect of Parkinson's-like symptoms as well. It's kind of what puts them into that camp. Okay. Done. Um, done. There we go. Uh, and then Paul Margulis asked, I thought for MSA it was a tauopathy. No, sir. So there are two tauopathies. It's cortical basal syndrome, also called cortical basal degeneration, and progressive supranuclear palsy. Those are our tau-based diseases. Um, MSA is actually an alpha-synucleinopathy in that it's alpha-synuclein, but it just affects the brain differently. It goes further back. It affects more the brain stem. So someone with MSA can have a dementia. But the real hallmark of MSA is that very early on in their disease, they start to have trouble with regulation of blood pressure, heart rate, et cetera. And in some cases, they can even have more balance and what's called ataxia because it actually affects further back called the cerebellum, which is generally never affected in Parkinson's disease. I'm marking them off as we go so I don't get confused. Is timing known for GBA mutations for dementia progression? Not yet. We do know there's a lot of research, actually probably one of the biggest new waves of research is looking at the you know, different genetic mutations and how they affect things, things like LARC2, Park, uh, Park and, and GBA mutations. But to my knowledge, the how the timing is different for GBA mutations for dementia isn't known yet, at least not that I've seen. 
Okay. So, um, from Ms. Wilder, can you please talk a little about a diagnosis of functioning neurologic disease with Parkinsonism? What is the difference with the diagnosis of this and Parkinson's? How do you determine which diagnosis? So I think I understand your question. So there's a term called a functional neurologic disease. And what that means is it's kind of, how to put it, um, it's essentially when the brain is producing these abnormal movements, but not from the typical way. So for example, and this kind of goes to your second question, someone with Parkinson's disease will have tremors or trouble moving their arms or legs. And we can actually look, and there's actually a specific CAM scan called a DAT scan that looks at dopamine in the brain. And if someone has tremors or trouble movement and their dopamine levels in the brain are reduced on this DAT scan, we can know that it is in fact Parkinson's disease. Someone with more of a functional neurologic disease essentially has more of these symptoms, but not necessarily related to a visible obvious thing like Parkinson's disease or strokes or Lewy body disease or something like that. There's thought that there is an overlap between anxiety or depression and these symptoms. And essentially it's our way of saying that the brain is still not functioning the way it should, but it's not through the more straightforward neurologic loss of dopamine cells, damage to the brain in that regard, but it's still kind of the, the brain malfunctioning. It's just not in a Parkinson's way. So the way we tell often what I would do is we would obviously meet, get a history, get an exam to see kind of what it looks like, to see if it looks like something like Parkinson's disease. And then if needed, we can do the DAT scan. In the what's worth, the same thing can be true of what's called a medication-induced Parkinsonism. There are some medicines that can actually cause Parkinson's-like symptoms, including tremor, stiffness, rigidity, that looks for all the world like Parkinson's disease. And they cause it because they are actually affecting dopamine in a negative way. So um, in that case, same thing, you can actually do a DAT scan to see because DAT scans look past the medications that cause the symptoms to see if there's really a reduction in dopamine to determine if it's actually Parkinson's disease or not. All right, what are some of the perspectives or frameworks you use when helping someone with Parkinson's maintain hope while navigating the reality of their diagnosis and the future progression of the disease? Excellent question. The first thing I say is it's important to be informed and that's what things like this are for. But it's also incredibly important to realize that not every person with Parkinson's gets every symptom and we won't necessarily know until it comes. So certainly if you have concerns, you let your doctor know. We talk about it, we talk through it. Parkinson's in and of itself is typically a very slowly progressive disease. I have patients that have had it for 30 years. I have patients that are in their mid to late 90s. I met a lovely lady a few weeks ago that was 101. So there's plenty of hope to be said that we can be having this conversation for literally decades, God willing. Now, sometimes things change. Dementia can occur and it can occur in different ages. Other symptoms that can make Parkinson's more difficult may occur, but we have to deal with them as they come. So generally what I say is, is while I admit it's easier said than done, Try not to focus on what may be. Let's focus on how we can get you living your best life now. All right. How is Parkinson's psychosis different than Lewy body disease? So Parkinson's psychosis, and again, it goes back to probably an important way. And one thing I'll say to my patients is there the difference in diagnosis and there's a the difference what, in what it, how it presents and what we can do about it. So the short version is Parkinson's disease psychosis is indistinguishable from Lewy body disease once they get to that point. The real difference is how you got there. So for example, if someone has Parkinson's disease for 10 years and starts to have memory problems and starts to have hallucinations, then by definition, that's Parkinson's disease that has progressed to a Parkinson's disease psychosis. Whereas someone with Lewy body disease would start to have memory problems within a first year Sometimes they can have memory problems even before they have Parkinson's physical symptoms. And very early on, again, within the first year or so, we'll start having hallucinations. So the main difference is timing. But as I mentioned earlier, 
the treatments are the same. There's not, as of now, a different treatment for Lewy body disease from Parkinson's disease. We simply have our toolbox of medications and we use them. Now, in some cases, the diagnosis matters in the sense that if it's a new diagnosis, patients with Lewy body disease don't tend to do as well with levodopa, so we want to be a little cautious. But that's also true in Parkinson's dementia. Once they get to that point, they can um, actually um, get a little worse with levodopa. So even if someone with Parkinson's disease is starting to have hallucinations, we still have to be a little cautious with levodopa. So the short answer is timing kind of gives the clues to the diagnosis, but when it comes to treatment, they're pretty similar. Um, rim behavior disorder, is it always associated with dementia? Definitely not. It's associated with more the Parkinson's family. So rim behavior disorder is again, when you can act out your dreams. It is part of the criteria for Lewy body or even MSA or Parkinson's because it occurs very commonly in all of them. But many patients with rim behavior disorder never go on to have dementia. So no, it is, it can be seen. So it's kind of which way you look at it. Patients with Lewy body dementia or even Parkinson's dementia can have rim behavior disorder and it's pretty common, but you can have rim behavior disorder with your Parkinson's and never go on to dementia. Well, that made sense. What is the typical time before dementia? So there isn't a typical one because the age of onset makes a difference. So if you took all Parkinson's disease patients forever and ever, it, the average age on to, to, if they're gonna have dementia, that's an important point. If they're gonna have dementia, the average age can be eight to 10 years, but that's like any average, it's affected by the extremes. So someone that's older that develops Parkinson's in their 80s might go on to have a dementia earlier on because again, age does become a factor. Whereas someone that's 50 could literally go take Michael J. Fox. He's had it for, I've lost track of how many years now. And to my knowledge, he has no evidence of dementia that I've heard of, but I do have my own patients that I know that I've known for 10 years that you know can get it in their 50s, 60s, 70s and are 10, 12, 15 years in. Like I said, I have patients that have had for 30 years that don't have dementia. So again, the average can be skewed by the extremes. The official answer is around the eight to 10 year mark, but absolutely it can go a lot longer and it may not occur at all. Um, I am not sure what to do with this question, so I'm gonna skip it. Um, oh, okay. Um, I'm just gonna skip that one. Um, okay. Okay. Um, is it true that if Parkinson's patients live long enough, all will develop Parkinson's dementia? No, that is not true. Um, as you, it's like everything in life. As we get older, things get a little more complicated. I mean, separate from Parkinson's, there's statistics that as the average population increases and the average age, you know, life expectancy increases, the risk of Alzheimer's increases with age, that the number, the percentage of patients with, that are 80 years old with Alzheimer's is higher than those that are 60. So generally speaking, that's true of anything. But officially, the numbers are that it's roughly, depending on which study you look at, it's 50 to 60% of patients with Parkinson's can go on to have a dementia. So, by that, it would mean that there are plenty, and again, I know plenty of them, that 40 to 50%, even that are living into their 80s and 90s, don't get dementia. So it's there's definitely a glass half full empty there. Um, but the official statistic, depending on which study you look at, is from 50 to 60%. I've seen some statistics as low as 40. I've seen some as high as 60. Um, and then, yes, age is a factor in that as well, but definitely not all. What are the side effects of Exelon? So Exelon and any acetylcholine medication, um, the um, most common side effect is <clears throat> um, upset stomach, honestly. Sorry, let me take some water. The most common side effect of Exelon is, um, is upset stomach because acetylcholine can you know, affect the GI system. That's the most common side effect we see. Now, with just about any medicine, including Exelon, headache, upset stomach, nausea can be part of it. 
most patients do fine with it. Generally speaking, with the patch, obviously a little skin irritation is most common. Um, with any medicine, someone can have a poor reaction to it. And to be fair, as you get into dementia and it advances, sometimes patients can be a little more sensitive to all medicines. We have to be careful. But generally speaking, it's upset stomach. So I'll note it has a ratio for new plasma is 1.6 or so, very dangerous. So I'm going to say, first of all, we're not going to get into the hazard ratio. That's probably a little too deep for this level of conversation. Secondly, most patients with um, the tank new plasma actually do fine, um, meaning that in the, in the studies, it was not a high dropout rate. It certainly was not a high severe side effect rate to Nuplazid. Early on in Nuplazid, the risk factors, um, excuse me, the risk of Nuplazid was a little concerning because you would get the, you got a news report on CNN probably a year after Nuplazid was released saying how many people passed away that were taking Nuplazid. But they actually did a pretty extensive study in the three years since then that actually found that it was not a particularly high risk of severe side effect or mortality. And in fact, the report, again, without getting into the pros and cons of mass news media, the report was a little bit misleading because it did not take into account the level of Parkinson's or the state. So basically, you know, if you said, every patient with Parkinson's disease, how many people die in a year, and especially if it's more advanced Parkinson's, um, to compare that to what it meant. Because again, that number came from essentially when you have any new medicine, they're required by law to report side effects because that has to be reported to the FDA. But the FDA and the company investigated it and it was actually much better than that. And knock on wood, I have not had any problems with any patients that I've given to. Um, again, hopefully I didn't jinx myself, but so far people have done very well on it. Now it is a serious medicine in that it is an antipsychotic, but it's not an antipsychotic in the realm of like the Haldols, Risperdals of the world that have the bigger, the concern for increased mortality as much as some of those two. So again, while we wanna take any medicine seriously, I, I don't put it in the same realm as those very strong medicines from the psychiatric standpoint. Um, so do some other medicines cause hallucinations as a side effect? The short version of that is any dopamine at too high a level can cause hallucinations. So yes, that is the answer. Now, um, Paul is really on, on this um, new plasma kick. Um, Paul, what I would recommend is that you're probably gonna to wanna to talk to your doctor about this um, if it's something you're considering. Now, I would say, again, most based on the studies that have been done and uh, my own experience, I would say the improvement is actually much better than 25%. Um, so I'll kind of I'll leave it at that. Um, and I will also say that I have never seen any data that it shortens your life. I think that you're lumping it in with the other antipsychotics, which it has been lumped in with more generally speaking. Um, you know, so I would say, again, if it's a medicine you're concerned about for anyone, not just Paul, for anyone, if you're having concerns about any medicine, have that conversation with your doctor, because um, then I would say it's worth conversation. Now that actually leads me into the next question. If it applies, is that good? Why aren't more doctors recommending it? Because again, it's still a big step. You know, it's still a, a big medicine. And while I, I disagree that it shortens your life, it's also we take any medication addition seriously. And in many cases, if we can get better control of hallucinations and delusions through acetylcholine medicines, memantine, we prefer that tact because those are medicines that, you know, the again, the list of side effects usually is upset stomach. Whereas Nuplazid does have more risk. Um, even if not shortening your life, it is a medicine we have to take a little more seriously. Um, like, so therefore we come to that again. The other reason is honestly, and this is a weird statement, I've had a lot of patients that I recommended Nuplazid to that haven't wanted to take it because the hallucinations don't bother them that much. If we can get control of them through other means, they would rather do that first. 
So it's really kind of a conversation. And, and that's true of all of this. It's a conversation between you and your doctor. Um, oh, hold on. Jared asked if I can end my PowerPoint sharing so we can see my full screen face. Oh, sure. There we go. Because why wouldn't you want to see my giant head? Okay, there we go. Hopefully that's better. All right. Um, so let's see. Benzos can be dangerous, can get seizures if you don't get it regularly. So if you're taking benzos, um, then yes, if you stop them abruptly, they could cause seizures. If you don't have a history of seizures and you taper the benzodiazepams, then you would not have withdrawal and you would not have seizures. So therefore, it depends on your history. Because again, one thing we have to be careful about in this context is we have to be really cautious about overgeneralizing. That, you know, so generally speaking, if someone has seizures, then that would be a different reason to take benzodiazepines. And if someone has severe psychiatric problems separate from their Parkinson's disease, they may need to be on medicines that could impact them cognitively. So generally speaking, um, we would want to be cautious about overgeneralizing. So yes, if you have a history of seizures and that is why you're taking your benzos, then that would be a reason that you would probably continue to take them. Uh, should medical marijuana be bad for dementia? Uh, not necessarily. It's kind of hard to say. It's because um, there's not a lot of data. Um, there's actually some smaller studies that suggest that it might help because it can reduce anxiety. But theoretically speaking, anything that can affect you mentally, including medical marijuana, could bring on hallucinations. So someone with Parkinson's, so I'll give an example. Someone with Parkinson's disease that's starting to creep towards Parkinson's psychosis may have never had a hallucination, but if they go to the hospital because they fell and hurt their back and they're given a strong pain medicine like morphine, they may have florid hallucinations until the morphine clears their, their system. So in that case, that same person might with medical marijuana have hallucinations. But again, it's hard to overgeneralize because we don't necessarily have that data yet. Um, do medications for cognitive symptoms have short half-life like levodopa, such that symptoms vary based on how much medication the bloodstream? Sorry, I said that fast. So do cognitive medicines get out of your system as quick as carbidopa levodopa? No. Car most medicines tend to last a um, uh, bit longer. So um, for example, the Exelon patch is once daily. Uh, Mamantine comes in a twice daily form and a once daily form. Um, uh, Denepazil is once daily. Rivastigmine in the pill form is twice daily. So as you can see, most of them are once or twice daily. So they do tend to last longer, which would limit the fluctuations. Um, how is lithium for anxiety? Um, lithium is usually for someone with bipolar disorder. It's not typically for anxiety. One thing, and again, if you're on it, that's between you and your psychiatrist. I'm not saying that's necessarily something you need to come off of, but for what it's worth, lithium is a big offender for exacerbating tremors. Now, again, please, 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 I'm not giving you advice to come off it. I don't want anyone to say that I heard a talk where someone said lithium can do X, Y, and Z, but it would not be high on my list for anxiety because it can exacerbate tremors. Um... See. Um, can well, I'm gonna. This seems like more of a statement than a question, but loss of sexual function can cause depression. Yes, it can. Um, but again, making it more general, um, how to put it if you're having loss of sexual function, then step one is speak to your urologist to see if there are medications that can help with this. Step two. If it's not something that can be helped or you're in the process of hopefully working on it and it's causing depression, then that's still you need to address the depression. Because even if there's a reason for depression, having Parkinson's disease, having Parkinson's disease symptoms, if there's a depression or anxiety that's untreated, it can exacerbate everything. So I could easily put that statement. Depression and anxiety can exacerbate Parkinson's symptoms, including depression and anxiety can exacerbate erectile dysfunction. 
is actually a very common cause. So again, an important thing is to understand how much these things overlap, but also understand that sometimes they do have to be treated separately. That if, if someone's having tremor that's worsened by anxiety and they just take more levodopa, it doesn't take away the anxiety, it can exacerbate the tremor because they're feeling anxious. So if you treat the anxiety, you can actually see an improvement in Parkinson's symptoms. So in that case, separately identifying and treating anxiety or in the question's case, depression, can make a big difference for the patient. Uh, which healthcare professional can do a test to see if you have cognitive decline? So it's called a neuropsychologist. So generally speaking, the, you can be referred to a neuropsychologist from either your primary care physician or from your neurologist. And then uh, neuropsychological testing takes a few hours, like three to four hours. You sit down and do a battery of tests to see kind of where your cognition is at. So that's often what we first recommend because sometimes you can have some of the early changes in Parkinson's and you want to see if it's starting to tiptoe into mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And a neuropsychologist who would help you. All right. Um, so the uh, slides will be available down the road. So you'll have to talk to Jared about that. I don't know if you'll be emailing them out. I think they will have access to them or they will have access to them. I don't know if they're emailing them out. Uh, any measure for prevention or delay of dementia and PD? That's where we get down to the healthy life, eating well. I know I'm a, it's going to be something that your doctors and certainly I am you know, beating the drum on exercise, that's the single biggest, um, being mentally and physically active. Um, there aren't necessarily medicines that have been shown to prevent, obviously, progression in Parkinson's or, or dementia, but getting out and getting exercise, cardiovascular exercise three times a week, getting out for walks, staying mentally active when you're at home. I know it's been difficult for the last you know, almost two years now, and I have seen a number of patients that were doing well from a cognitive standpoint that have had some worsening symptoms in the last two years, because frankly, you know, for all of us, if you're stuck at home, our brains are just not being used the same way. We're, there's been a, not just in the Parkinson's community, but worldwide, an increase in depression, anxiety, um, headaches, migraines, exacerbation of Parkinson's symptoms, all that has become real in the last two years. So to the best of our ability, do the opposite of that. Try to be as active as you can, even if you're at home physically and mentally. Um, is there evidence of diets that hurt Parkinson's? So what I would say is, is it's about vascular health. Like there have been studies that poorly controlled hypertension can exacerbate and you know, speed up Parkinson's a little bit, poorly controlled cholesterol, diabetes. So what I would say is, is it's, you know, get in addition to seeing your neurologist, make sure you're having your regular checked up with your primary care physician that your cholesterol is in good order, that you're, you're you know, to the best of your ability, um, maintaining a good healthy weight, um, that you're eating well, all those things. But really it's, it's the high fat, high sugar kind of diets, things that are like that quick energy because those create and worsen vascular disease. And that absolutely worsens Parkinson's disease. Right. Um, does Parkinson's have an effect on erectile dysfunction? If so, is there anything that other than the typical medications we have to consider? So Parkinson's can affect erectile dysfunction and that's where it's difficult um, because as gentlemen age, we can have erectile dysfunction for a number of reasons. Parkinson's is a possibility, but to answer your question, no, there is no specific Parkinson's medicine to treat it. So generally speaking, uh, we would want to have you talk to your urologist because ultimately you would want to first be checked, make sure there's nothing else. Because again, a pet peeve of mine is when doctors say, oh, it's just the Parkinson's, but what if there are other things? What if you know, there is an actual problem with the prostate or something else that can be treated? Then in that case, improving prostate health can actually improve urinary function or erectile dysfunction. And if not, then they can help guide you on the best options from a medication choice for erectile dysfunction. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, plant food diet is perfectly fine. Just make sure you're getting the, the protein, you know, make sure you're getting your protein because one of the things that happens or that can happen when Parkinson's patients lose weight is they lose muscle. So you wanna make sure that in whatever diet you're including, whether it's 
vegan, vegetarian, et cetera, want to make sure that you're getting, um, you know, plenty of protein. Now, obviously, I know someone's going to say, yes, keep protein to the best you can away um, from your carbidopa levodopa. But, you know, other than keeping carbidopa levodopa away from your protein, you still want to make sure you have your protein in your diet. Um, would I use Prevagen as a supplement because I, if I was diagnosed with MCI? Excellent question, John. Um, maybe, um, you know, I'm definitely, I definitely am on the mindset and, and I've actually said this to patients that, um, you know, it, it doesn't cause any harm. And if it's something you're worried about, it may be worth a try, but I, I always just cautious to take cost into, into a factor that like, you know, if, if, if it's something you want to try, give it a few months, but I also can't ignore the fact that I can get it something like $50 a bottle or something like that. So, you know, I guess it depends how much I'm, I'm having. Like if I really started to get into legit mild cognitive impairment, then I'd probably try some supplements. Hopefully not yet. All right, so we have two minutes until closing remarks. So I'm gonna try to go through um, as best we can. Uh, many more. So how is Parkinson's dementia actually diagnosed? I don't think my husband has an actual diagnosis yet, just Parkinsonism. So that's where we kind of combine. So first and foremost, Parkinsonism essentially means that Parkinson's like symptoms, but we don't even know if it's Parkinson's yet. So first we try our very best to determine if it is in fact Parkinson's disease or in the Parkinson's family, as opposed to, you know, for example, someone we see this all the time, someone that's 85 that has a tremor and maybe they're not walking well because of knee problems and back problems and they're a little stupid forward because of prior neck surgery. They're told they have Parkinsonism, but they don't necessarily have Parkinson's disease. So first see a neurologist or maybe a movement specialist to determine it. Secondly, from a dementia standpoint, that's where we will often either do short cognitive testing in clinic like myself or we will um, send you to have that neuropsychological testing. So short answer is see a movement specialist to determine if it is in fact Parkinson's disease. Second, they can then refer you to a neuropsychologist to do, to do the more formal testing. The reason they send you to the neuropsychologist again is that testing takes like four hours. And so it's not something that we can usually do in clinic. Um, how many psychiatrists know anything about PD? That is a good question. That's and it's a difficult question because short answer is not that many. At our center, we do have a neuropsychiatrist, Dr. McGeed, that has training in both neurology and psychiatry. There are a few out there. There's one in Georgetown as well, Dr. Anderson. She's great. Um, there are a few others. But sometimes we just need help from a depression and anxiety standpoint. That if, for example, you ask me, well, my, my citalopram doesn't work, um, you know, and what's a better medicine for depression? As a neurologist, it's not what I've been explicitly trained in. I've done, I know all about Parkinson's medicines and can tell you the ins and outs and pros and cons, but I can't tell you why Lexapro is different than Citalopram is different than Zoloft. I know they all work. I have an idea of ones that are a little better to help wake you up, ones that are a little better if you're having trouble sleeping, but that is specifically what psychiatrists are trained in. So in some cases, you don't necessarily need your psychiatrist to to know all about Parkinson's as long as they're willing to be a part of the team and we can have a conversation. That's the most part. All right, one last question. Um, what things typically appear in hallucinations? So for what it's worth, most Parkinson's patients that I've spoken to say they don't tend to be scary things, usually something that's there. I have some patients that'll see a bird. I have a lot of patients that turn it up, they'll see a cat go by even though they don't have a cat. Um, sometimes they'll see people, but knock on wood, as far as I've heard, they aren't scary things. Like they will be just something that's there, not confrontational, not traumatic, just there. So with that, I would like to thank you all so very much for coming. A few closing remarks. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's program. You'll receive an email. Oh, there you go. The gentleman that put his email in the link. You'll receive an email with the link to evaluate today's program. Please take time to do so. We hope you'll try some of the PFNCA exercise and speech classes if you haven't already. You can register on the PFNCA webpage at www.pfnca.org. Thank you to anyone and everyone who made donations as part of the registration for today's program. If you have not made a donation and would like to, 
you can certainly do so by visiting www.pfnca.org. Thank you again to Kensington Senior Living for their important support for today's lecture. And absolutely, thank you all for being with me today and with us today. It was a great pleasure talking to you and hopefully I'll see you online for the Parkinson's Symposium with PFMTA in a few months. Thank you so much. Bye everybody.